Okay, welcome to session two of the FCSI BYO CEU event. We have a couple of great speakers lined up for you this session. And before we head into that, I wanna cover a couple housekeeping items. This session will be recorded. All attendees are in listen only mode. We will host a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Please use the Q&A feature to post your questions. This session qualifies for 1.5 CEUs. Upon entering the Zoom session, you were asked to enter your name. This will allow us to track your participation. We will submit to FCSI to ensure that you receive your CEUs. We'll give everyone a couple minutes to make sure your name is entered correctly before we capture attendance. With that, Betsy Craig is the nation's leading expert on food allergies, menu labeling, and food safety. She is an award-winning CEO and founder of Menu Trinfo LLC. Besides menu labeling and nutritional help desk needs, Craig's company is the parent company of Allertrain, a food allergen and gluten-free food safety training suite of courses, as well as Kitchens with Confidence, a certifying and accredited kitchen auditing division. This newest division helps manufacturers and commercial kitchens to be called certified free from one or all eight major food allergens and or gluten. Menu Trinfo is dedicated to helping hundreds of thousands in food service establishments protect the lives and health of their customers. Let's go over to Betsy in Maryland, where she will, where she will be discussing designing an allergen-free back of house. Thank you, Tim. Let me just, oops, let me just get myself organized here for one second. I apologize for the technical difficulties, and hopefully that's the last of them. Um, but if for some reason I do go offline, just give me half a second and I will pop back on. Technology works beautiful when it works beautiful. Um, and so I'm grateful to be here. Uh, thank you, Janelle, for asking me to be a contributor to your event. Um, my name is Betsy Craig. I'm the president and VP of client acquisition. That's a new title of Menu Trinfo. We are based in Fort Collins, Colorado. And as was said in my intro, let's see. There we go. Menu Trimpo exists to inform people what's in their food so they can eat with confidence. We started in 2010 as a nutrition labeling company, have grown into an allergy training, certified free from consulting, uh, jack of all trades, master of a few. Um, so I'm happy to share some knowledge I hope with you and maybe get some questions answered. If you have questions as it comes up today, uh, during my short presentation, please feel free to go ahead and put those in the appropriate chat. And I believe that they will be fed to me towards the end of the presentation I have for you today. So let's talk for a second about food allergies. What are they? Why does it matter? Why do we care? Um, where are we seeing like the biggest impact of food allergies in the market, in the food service market today? And I have to start with higher education because higher education is one of those places where we just keep seeing over and over people having challenges with food allergic reactions. This is actually to our friends just north of us up in Canada, in Ontario, Canada, to be exact. The student, first year student comes to college, Queen's College, I believe, Queen's University, pardon me, School of Medicine. Um, but Queen's uh, University is where she was going to school um, and in Kingston, Ontario, and passed away from an allergic reaction on campus. And then it takes us to a gluten-free reaction. And a lot of times we do put together food allergies and gluten-free. You'll see why in a few minutes. But the short answer is the protocol is the same in the back of the house uh, regarding gluten or an allergen. But here we have a lawsuit that came out about to a restaurant within Colonial Williamsburg campus. Um, you know, down in Virginia, they reenact the days of the colonial times. And a student went down there to uh, partake with his schoolmates and learn about Colonial Williamsburg. He was there uh, for the whole day. He went and started to sit down to eat lunch, uh, opened up and brought his lunch out. The child was uh, eight, nine, 10 years old pretty articulate young man from what I understand, but a young guy. Um, he was told he couldn't eat what he brought. Long story short, the case is still going on down in the courts in Virginia. Um, but we do expect some interesting legislation and results to come out of that case 
um, they had the child eat out on the back steps in the rain while his friends all ate together and experienced the colonial times of food um, without him being allowed. It was pretty horrible for that young man. Yeah, we're seeing where that one ends up, that's for sure. And then finally, Pittsburgh, uh, University of Pittsburgh had a student that had an allergic reaction on that campus. And this one, oops, I brought to you, although I don't know how to get it back. That one actually came about as a cross contact in equipment, which I thought was really relevant when we're talking about food service equipment and how it plays into food allergy success. And then it doesn't matter who you are, what you are, even Harvard has had a problem with it this past year. Um, back in February, some of the food allergy students there are really having struggles on campus. Now this is all pre-COVID. Uh, some of the dining halls are back open on that campus, um, but they have not fully addressed this issue. And whether it be cross contact, whether it be that ingredient or the proper, not having proper equipment, um, the challenges are absolutely plentiful on campuses, but not just college campuses. Let me parlay this and kind of shoot this over to B&I. Um, I'm seeing it in healthcare. I'm seeing it on you know, work campuses where people are still showing up or showing up again, um, even after COVID, trying to eat safely and having challenges. So. Food allergies aren't going anywhere. Um, back in 2011, when we started Allertrain within Menu Trimpo, there were 15 million people with food allergies at that time. A study that was just released in 2019 showed that grew from 15 million to 32 million people with food allergies. That is a lot of people with food allergies. I have been around the industry for since the 80s, when I first started working the early 80s. When I first started, we're, oh, wait one second, looks like I've got something going on here. Hang on one second, folks. I'm gonna stop my screen for half a second. I have more than once done a webinar where all of a sudden it just keeps going forward on me and that gets kind of crazy. So I apologize. Uh, I just need to get rid of these transitions um, so that I can talk rudely and not try to run in front of the transition. There we go that back to slides. Yes. Yes. There we go. Um, so back in the early 80s, when I was first starting in the food service business, we never had anybody with food allergies. Now, all of a sudden, they're coming out of the woodwork as time marches on. There's a lot of folks that want to know why. I wish I had that answer. Uh, there are a number of key theories as to why people are allergic to a number of set allergens. We just don't have the firm answer as to why. What we do know is that 90% of the people with food allergy are allergic to one of these big eight that you see on the wheel in front of you. Coconut is included as a tree nut. So people always ask about coconut. It turns out coconut's a fruit, not a tree nut, but the FDA included it. So we always have to call it out. Um, so it is technically listed as one of the big eight allergens. In the last year or so, you might have seen some news come across that sesame is going to be named one of the big allergens. That will actually come out as being number nine. And there's a, um, a bill making its way through Capitol Hill right now, um, <clears throat> along with other very important things, of course. Um, but this bill has to... Um, is being asked to add sesame and call it the big nine allergens. And then finally, I want to address about mustard on labels that you might see on packaged goods. Mustard is a big allergen in Canada and we're seeing it kind of filter south um, where consumers are looking for mustard to be called out on labels. And again, these are labels of CPG, consumer packaged goods, and we're starting to see more and more labels on foods you might pick up at the deli, or you might pick up at a cafeteria, or um, you know, just a packaged good that's made, you know, the sandwich is made and they print off a label for you, and it might include the allergens. There's a big push to see more and more of that happening here. In the Betsy, US. can you uh, reshare your screen? We're no, not. Oh, that would stuff. probably be helpful, wouldn't it? Sorry, let's see if I can. There we go. There we go. Oh, Thank I you. 
mostly. Um, I would like to tell you that it's 100% fixed. I'm not totally sure, so let's see what we have. Um, we were, I was on the top allergens. I think this is where I left off on visual. Is that correct, Tim? I'm gonna sure is. On, let's jump in. Okay, great. So here's the big eight allergens. They're the most prominent in the country. I talked about coconut, talked about sesame. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. First off, the picture is worth a thousand words. So this is what you have to go through if you want to figure out if you have a food allergy. You have to go through what's called a scratch test. They take a patch of your skin, or in this case, somebody's back, and they scratch the allergen on there and see if you have an allergic reaction to that. And then they go back and figure out which items that you're allergic to. What you're seeing here is actually tree nut allergies. And you can see that, you know, he's allergic to number eight, and number seven, and number six. It's pretty horrible to have to go through this, but necessary to figure out what someone is allergic to. Um, and as I was saying, they don't know for sure. Um, there's the theory that we're eating food that's been processed too much. There's a theory that um, we're too clean in this country with all our Purell hand sanitizer. I was saying this before COVID, now I really can say it. Um, we're definitely clean with our hands, which is a good thing, but um, there's concern that young people are not getting out and playing in the dirt enough and getting their immune systems working at a younger age and that's causing them to have more and more food allergies especially if they grow older so let's talk for a second about gluten because gluten and gluten-free started to make its way on restaurant menus and consumer goods well, it's been coming in consumer goods for 20 years, but it's been making its way in food service for about the last 10. Um, gluten is a stretchy protein that allows the air bubbles. In fact, in a good loaf of French bread, like you're seeing in the top right picture, those bubbles mean it was made right. If you think about the consistency of that French bread compared to a cornbread, it's totally a different texture. And the gluten is the protein uh, inside that allows things to stick and be sticky together. We have a lot of gluten-free options out there and a lot more gluten-free choices that are yummy compared to even just five years ago. It's pretty amazing. I will tell you that gluten-free and food allergies are both still on the rise. Gluten-free has settled out. We had a huge uptick of people thinking gluten-free was gonna let them get skinny or gluten-free was the new Atkins. Or... Once people got over that and realized gluten-free did not mean lower calorie, that gluten-free really is a medical diet for somebody who has GI issues, um, the, the excitement of it and the coolness of it went away and now those eating gluten-free are doing so for their diet, for their health. I talked for a moment about the consumers, the number of consumers um, you know, going from 15 million to 32 million. Well, this is a survey that was put out by FAIR, which stands for Food Allergy Research and Education. They're the nonprofit food allergy, um, one of the nonprofit food allergy groups outside DC. There's actually 13 of them in the country. I'd say FAIR is probably the biggest right now. Um, they came out with the study that showed it jumped to 32 million. But their opinion based on this research is that one out of every four consumers are looking at menu items or labels and won't buy products that contain any of the top nine allergies. Now they're using sesame as one of those allergies in this picture, um, but it's, they, they equate it to 85 million people will not buy items that contain the allergens to protect one person or more in their household. Um, I know that I'm in the middle of this world, especially with Allotrain and Kitchens with Confidence and all the stuff that I do around food allergies, um, but I regularly get talked to by people who, who relate, who share that they have a food allergy, someone in their family has a food allergy. It is way more than it has ever been. 71% of folks check food labels every single time they shop, and it's between three to five minutes per product which was pretty amazing when I talked with a, a large retailer in the country talking about certified free from and having our seal on food products to give another layer of confidence. Think about having consumers clog up aisles because they're standing there reading labels for hours and hours. I have a friend when she first got diagnosed with food allergies, 
she went to the grocery store and it took her almost two hours to shop. And she said she cried almost the whole time. It's pretty hard when you go through that test I showed you before and you come out and you have a whole list of, it's like a Chinese food, you know, you can't have column A and you really should try to stay away from part of column B. It's pretty overwhelming and um, trying to figure out how to safely feed people like this and accommodate folks like this is really a, a it's a labor of love. The picture you see before you is a number of different folks. Uh, uh, Drew Brees, is he still playing? Oh, he probably is, and I probably just stepped in it. I apologize if you're a football player and I just stepped in it, but every picture, every one of these um, famous folks you see in front of you on the screen has a food allergy or gluten um, intolerance. It's very, very common. It's gotten more and more common through the years, as we can tell. And you can't tell somebody has a food allergy. They don't walk with a limp. It's not like you can see it. It's just that little bitty morsel can just get them. What can you do to accommodate those with food allergic, food allergies? That's the question. And when I started to take this from the brain side and, and get my head wrapped around equipment, what you guys do, how you design things, how you make success happen for people with food allergies. I really, um, I started to think about it. And this is the, the next picture is the best picture I can show you that makes it so clear as to why food allergic diners are accounting on you who are designing facilities, designing back of houses, designing front of houses with the right equipment can mean the right meal. And so that that person can go from their dinner to dessert, not to the ER. And that is the game plan. So if you go ahead and look at this, and I apologize for my blank text box there, but if you go ahead and look at this, one milligram of a peanut, a tiny, tiny milligram can cause lethal anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is the allergic reaction that happens by a minuscule amount or larger that puts somebody into two or more severe reactions. Things like loss of breath, hives, swelling the throat or nose, those sort of things that make breathing not possible. And that's what people die from. They die because their throat closes, they die because they can't get air into their lungs, and, and CPR doesn't work. You can't shove air down if you can't get air down through the throat. Um, it takes, it takes uh, full epinephrine to stop somebody's anaphylaxis reaction to something as small as just a piece of a dime, if you will, just smaller than a dime. So preventing cross contact, here's where you get to be the hero. Here's where you get to play in this world and make the difference. And preventing cross contact can come in these areas, toasters, equipment, cleaning and cleaning equipment, small wares, the right systems, things like fryers, and I'll get into all this. These are all areas I know you guys touch, and they're all areas that can have a lasting impact on the consumer that I pay attention to taking care of. Let's talk pizza. Who doesn't want to talk pizza? I could talk a lot of pizza with COVID. Let me tell you, I'm, I'm all about pizza. I love something coming out of an oven. Give me a, <laughs> give me a wood burning oven. Give me something that's 400, 500 degrees. There's one in Fort Collins, Colorado that I don't know, they say it's like 900 degrees in 90 seconds to cook pizza. It's amazing. It just does it so fast. And all of that's wonderful up until I'm allergic to wheat. And I want to eat out. And I want to eat out with my friends or family. Let's pretend it's normal times where we can eat out. If I were to walk into a pizzeria and saw something like the piece of equipment you see here on the right, on a countertop, or I knew through social media and pictures they put on Instagram that says we can take care of anybody. Come have a cauliflower crust pizza over here. You know, the cauliflower crust pizza is going so fast and it's not just the, you know, the keto folks of the world. Cauliflower pizza crust is actually really, really good. And it's good for you. And if you can't eat gluten or you can't eat wheat, it's the answer. And it is the answer the consumer wants. So you take a tabletop oven, a couple thousand dollars, I don't know, I saw like ranges of what they run, no pun intended on the word range, and I was like, it is so simple. It is so easy to spec this in and have this be an answer for those diners. I can't even imagine it would take a month to make that up. 
honestly. The blow, the blow back and the blow up and the excitement, the sales increase I see when a restaurant does something as simple as buy the right piece of equipment on top of what they're already planning to buy to make the difference for this consumer. There used to be a, probably still there, I haven't, I haven't been there in a couple of years, an Italian concept in Chicago, go figure, um, that had like six or seven locations. And they implemented tabletop ovens. They had regular ovens and lots of good Italian food and everybody loved them for their Italian food. They did something similar to this. I don't know what brand they used. I don't know if they were new or used. I don't care. What I do know is they had them freshly cleaned and they promoted on Facebook, we now can take care of those that are allergic to wheat or choose gluten-free. They watched their sales increase by 8% in one month off of like three social media posts. That's it. There really is a way to win with something as simple as one extra piece of equipment. Okay, so let's talk next about where else I'm seeing simple pieces of equipment make a difference. Pardon me. In the, in the higher education space, we were used to all you care to eat. Like that was the answer for higher ed for everybody. Right now, it's not that way with COVID. I do believe we'll be getting back to there. It probably, the best case I can see is August 2021 is when colleges will be able to go back to all you care to eat. Um, however, lines, buffet lines, setups like this, and uh, are really standard in that space. But add the idea of this aller this space right here, these four steam table rows are going to be allergen free or free from seven of the big eight. What you see in front of you is a food allergy line that's free from seven of the big eight. They still have fin fish there, but this is an area of a college dining um, facility that any student with a food allergy of the big eight minus fish plus gluten can go eat safely. And the students know that. Um, and I wrote down the three top food providers in that space in this country are Sodexo, Compass, which has a whole bunch of divisions, and Aramark. And between the three, um, the first one, Simple Servings, is what Compass, or excuse me, what Sodexo calls it. True Balance is what Aramark calls it, and Pure Eats is what Compass and their divisions call their free from areas. Talking about these simple, um, these simple lines that you can roll straight out into a dining area, you can prepare in the back of the house and roll forward or sit there permanently. You know, four steam table pants, this one has five, sometimes as small as three, makes all the difference to that consumer. This also happens, and I'm seeing it more and more on big campuses like the Google type campuses of the world, um, where they're making these stations safe. Now, this is where I come in when it comes to certifying these areas as safe. That's the kitchens with confidence side that we do, uh, making sure that they know how to handle the food leading up to when it gets put out to be displayed and be taken, um, and make sure that it is free from and certified free from and there's testing involved and there's protocol and there's sourcing, but the right equipment, all that's great if you put it in equipment that's dirty, doesn't, not dirty um, like they didn't wash it, but dirty like has allergens in it before, that's no good. That's why specking in and making sure that these institutions have a place to be allergen free. I also will put a plug in here and say even places like jails and prisons and institutions are needing more and more of this. We're seeing, I just heard of a lawsuit out on the West Coast, probably not terribly far from where you all are, where um, somebody was incarcerated and they said, I have an allergy and it didn't matter. Uh, they weren't fed right and there's a massive lawsuit going on and it was a private provider. So we'll see where that one goes um, to see if it has more bandwidth. I Two more things here and then I will be done. If there's any questions, I'll be able to take them. I'll have a minute or two left. But I want to give a plug for hand wash sinks. <laughs> One of the best things we can do to help people with food allergies is make sure we're always keeping our hands clean. It is the number one area for cross contact. I know that hand washing is, has always been vital, 
and we've never been able in the food safety space to really drive that home. COVID has us driving at home. I'm not happy about COVID in any way, shape, or form. However, I am thrilled that hand washing is getting, you know, the front line of defense because it really will help those with food allergies. We've been trying to teach it for food allergies since 2011. And then finally, toasters. You can't use a gluten-free toaster and a gluten toaster together. You have, we always encourage a separate gluten-free toaster, always. And I'm gonna end with a topic that's a little bit controversial because people say, well, what about, you know, what about the hood? What about the ventilation system? Um, what do we do about airborne allergens? I will tell you that airborne allergens are not very common. They really, really aren't. However, the examples I've heard of have been around fryers. So this is something that I taught a, a brand years ago, that if you're gonna have a line of fire, fryers, pardon me, <clears throat> let's make sure the mouse working, we're getting to the end here. If I'm gonna have four fryers in a row, then I'm gonna buy three connected and one separate. If I'm gonna have five, I'm gonna buy four together and one separate. The one separate's gonna have my clean oil in it every time and it's gonna be my allergen free fryer. So um, from a spec side, from the back of the house side, um, encouraging folks to, to purchase this way, uh, let's then have the flexibility to serve the diners, which are increasing. I mean, 85 million are 85 million. By the way, the moms and dads of the kids with food allergies also stay free from those allergens because what if that child reaches across and grabs a fry out of mom's plate, you know? We're seeing that more and more and more. It's being driven more and more. And for you to suggest it or to encourage folks to go ahead and um, be mindful of it as they're designing, that could be really, really huge. So I'm going to leave this up for just a minute and ask Tim if there's any questions that have come up. Um, we're happy to take them. Yeah, so I, I'm actually going to uh, chime in on a couple things that I wanted to just kind of help kick this off. Um, really great information on the allergy side of things. And then just to kind of spur all of my fellow designers to start thinking about things like that allergen free toaster um, separated from the main toaster. You know, those are, it's the little things that as designers, I think we overlook. We think mm -hmm. a toaster is a toaster, but having a separate allergen free toaster would escape our mind, I think, in most cases. And then on the fryer side of things, from a design standpoint, also remembering to somehow separate that allergen-free fryer from the bank of regular fryers so that things don't jump over into the other. We all know, you know, fryers throw grease everywhere. And even if it's a separate fryer, but next to it, it's still gonna contaminate the one next to it. So we need to be thinking about those things as designers. And then the one thing that I wanted to just kind of talk about a little bit, um, <clears throat> I've dealt with this a little bit on one of my grandkids, but people don't really think about the gluten-free side of things and how it relates to autism. And I know everybody thinks of, you know, the, the true autistic kid, but with the rise of children that are on the autism spectrum, but not necessarily fully what you would think of as autistic, but still gluten is a large trigger for that. So the gluten-free thing is there's a lot of demand there. Um, so I think as designers, we need to start thinking about that a little bit more. And I would love for you to talk about that for just a minute. Thanks, Tim. Those are all great points. And thanks for kind of bringing that all together and, and making the synergistic tie, if you would. Um, there has been study upon study, not just of autism, but of asthma and allergies, not, not the anaphylaxis allergies with gluten, but things like eczema and um, sneezing and migraines, all sorts of repercussions for folks that are eating gluten that really shouldn't. And um, there's a study going on at Colorado State right now uh, over autism and gluten and dairy. Actually, I always ask people when they tell me that they're trying to keep their child away from gluten for behavioral reasons. I always say, well, are you doing dairy too? Because the two, um, more than half of the people that eat gluten free also eat dairy free. Um, there's, a, there's a huge connection there. And we're seeing that I personally believe 
that food is medicine. I have a personal story. It's, you know, it's the, the thing I do the most public speaking on is talking about my own personal food story and how I started this company and, and where I've come to. And it has to do with garbage in, garbage out for me. And what caused me to be ill and I took away the unhealthy foods helped me get better, helped me get well from an autoimmune disease. So I am a, I am a firm believer in it. I've heard of the results from parents across the country. I have the emails to prove it from folks that are saying, yeah, it's great for this, but I don't have eczema anymore. It's great for this, but I don't have the big old watermelon belly anymore. I mean, it's amazing what we're doing to ourselves as a country on food. And I have to be careful because I have to take half a step off my box on that one. Um, it's pretty wild to watch uh, what our industry is doing. Um, and then if I could just for another half a second go on that the, if the designer thinks about it, the customer's going to be so appreciative. It's not about trying to get an extra box you're selling. It's about giving a solution they don't even know they're going to have a problem for. Um, and I've seen that over and over. Hey, Betsy, this is Janelle. It looks like we have a couple other questions. Um, how do you address the trust factor in developing allergen-free options for customers? Do customers well, we, enlarge? Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna go ahead. Is there a part B to that? So there's I a part B. Yep. Okay. Um, do you want? Do customers enlarge multi-venue serving facilities trust that the allergen-free options offered are actually safe? Well, that's part of why we come in and do certified free from. So our division, Kitchens with Confidence does and their website's there, you can go check it out. The consumer doesn't believe the food service purveyor a lot of the times. And that's why uh, third person accreditation matters. We're going through ISO accreditation right now for our certification. We, have, we make them do tests every month, at least once a month, sometimes more often. We check all the products, we check all the menu items, we check all the recipes. So it gives, you know, you've seen that gluten-free seal on food and it's like a GF in the middle and it's a certified gluten-free. Um, that's what the consumer's looking for. And we're seeing more and more people are gonna want that in the food service space, especially coming back from COVID, especially because we're all scared to death right now to eat out. Actually, I can't say we all are. I'm not, I ate out last night, but it was a good football game. However, um, folks are going to want to know, especially in this space, that somebody is looking over, the big brother, big sister is looking over to make sure it's safe, um, especially when it comes to food allergies. So yeah, you mentioned Kitchens with Confidence in the next part of this question. You kind of answered it, but what programs have you seen where operators do more than simply put up posters and offer nutritional labeling? Yeah, I, had, I didn't even think this was going to be a thing. And uh, I sure wasn't ready to start a whole nother division in 2017 when it began, but it began with Cornell University and a dining hall that were that's free from gluten, peanut and tree nut called Risley Dining, Risley Dining Hall on campus. And it has grown into other campuses and grown into food service products and grown into consumer packaged goods. And so it is a very rigid, stringent audit followed by a lot of follow-up they have to do, and it's an annual in-person audit, and um, the, you know, the consumers are starting to recognize the seal in just a couple short years. And the food service folks, we just did a blog about this. In fact, it's on KWC. It's a blog about a college that's free from tree nut and peanut, and a kid had a reaction three days in a row, a freshman this year, and, and went to dining and said, I've been sick. I had to give myself epi. Something's wrong. You're free from areas aren't free from. And they called us because they're one of our, our schools. And we said, whoa, 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 you're fine. We, have the kid go to the allergist. And in this case, the kid had three new allergies he didn't even know about. He came back and he says, guess what? I'm allergic to these additional things and I ate that. So um, they slept at night. The, the, in our case, our customer who was the school the registered dietitian and the dining director were like, okay, well, KWC says we're cool. Let's see what happens. The student happily went and got checked and it wasn't the school at all. The area was free from, it was a new allergy for that student. 
Thank you for that. And I, I went ahead and posted the link to Kitchens with Confidence just so it was easy okay. to access to learn more about that. You know, I do have another question for you before we wrap up, Betsy. And, you know, when you and I first met, you were telling me about Red Robin. And I'd like you to share that story a little bit, just about an operator that um, has done a really good job of dealing with food safety or allergen safety. Sure. So I got called into there years ago, years and years ago. Um, and they wanted to be able to offer gluten-free fries. And they are the first ones that did that and in the space. They also have a wonderful interactive menu on a tablet where they offer uh, people to say, I'm allergic to these things. And it sorts those out and tells them what they can eat, which is really, really cool. We do that through nutrition calculator now in our nutrition side. But when I went to their test kitchen and I went to their you know, ground zero, um, I saw the fryers and I was like, why don't we make one of these fryers this? And then the closest fryer that anybody can put gluten containing ingredients is two more away because as Tim said, oil jumps, like I get that, but it doesn't jump over four fryers. It only has a certain amount of area that it can jump. And I've even had people so concerned and not with Red Robin, but with other folks, so concerned that they've taken one fryer and then put a metal barrier between that and the next set of fryers. Um, but Red Robin, anytime you want gluten-free fries, you can know they're gluten-free. They come in gluten-free. They're only done in the first bin of fryers. Nothing else can touch it. It's, it's absolutely, um, you know, is there anything 100% foolproof? No, there are no absolute guarantees in this world. However, um, if they, it's like, that's your standard operating procedure. That's what people check for. Um, that, that first fryer is always the gluten-free fryer. Shrimp goes on the far left and only other containing agreements or ingredients can go on the third or the fourth fryer in the back of their house. Pretty amazing. They also got nailed, like they so got, got tons of press and tons of love and tons of sales and a, a really big bump from getting it out there and sharing with people what they were doing so successfully. Thanks, Bessie. It's a lot of great information to think about and uh, I really appreciate your, your presentation there. Next up, we're gonna head Thank over to Southern California where Tom Cowley will talk conveyors and accumulators. Tom started his career with the food service industry in 2007 as a rep in Southern California, focusing on key segments, working with consultants, dealers, and end users. In 2018, Tom jumped from the rep side to the factory side as he took on the role of Western Regional Sales Manager for Caddy Corporation. Tom, over to you. Hey, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Betsy. Um, appreciate everybody's time. Um, really want to thank everybody for jumping on and um, committing to this time to kind of go through some conveyor systems and stuff. And um, we're going to segue from the food over to getting the food into the dish, uh, the dish room and kind of the best ways to do that. <clears throat> I did want to just answer one near and dear question to my heart from Betsy is that Drew Brees will be completely fine in about three weeks or so when they go to play Kansas city, he's just got a couple broken ribs. So he is still playing. So you're, you're good. Um, anyway, on to my, my kind of presentation here. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to, you know, different conveyors and kind of uh, getting things back to the dish room, um, there's kind of, there's certain factors and things that we're going to kind of cover and go through. Just, this is a kind of preempt of what we're looking at. You know, um, typically we're going to focus uh, when you're talking about conveyors and dish rooms are typically going to be soil tray conveyors or just soil conveyors in general. Um, how do we determine what belt is going to be correct for the application? What are those determining factors that are going to lead me to that application and lead me to the correct belt? And then when we do um, more customized stuff, actually, when we get back into the dish room, we can have soil tables in conjunction with conveyors. And we're going to talk about verticals, accumulators, all kinds of fun stuff. So, again, I want to thank everybody's time. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Janelle, for the invitation. And thanks for all the efforts of putting this together. We're going to go ahead and start with the, um, on the, oops, sorry about that. We're going to start basically anytime you're going to um, figure out what type of conveyor system you're utilizing, there's going to be certain pieces of information you're going to need to determine the type of belt that's going to go with the, um, with the conveyor system, right? That's basically what we're trying to figure out is what belt is right for the items that we're trying to move from point A to point B. Okay. 
the thing that's going to dictate that are the items that we're moving. Okay. The items that we're moving are always going to dictate the type of belt that we are going to place with our conveyor system. Um, in the event that we have a band conveyor, um, the application is very simple. It's for trays and trays only. We're not going to move individual pieces with this type of system. We're also not going to, sorry, we're also not going to utilize this to move uh, bus tubs or racks or anything of that nature. Okay, um, these type of systems will have weight loads and restrictions and things that we try to adhere to um, that will place it in these applications. Okay, um, because this will only move roughly seven pounds a foot, uh, we are going to stick to trays. Okay, this is also great for tray makeup, and there's some key features and benefits for this system that um, will lend itself to why this is a perfect uh, solution for some applications. As you can see for, from here, what makes this such a nice, easy system is that everything is surface mounted. Okay, when I mean everything surface mounted, that means that the only time that the conveyor belt will will remove will come off the top of the bed is to go into the motor housing, into that pulley, and then come back up. Okay, there is no return underneath the bed. There is no drip tray. We'll discuss that as we get into uh, some other conveyor belt options that. Um, I really, really need these items in order to kind of keep things clean. Okay, because that's always something we're concerned about too, right? Is creating a mess and making sure that when we're transferring these items from point A to point B, that there's not a, you know, there, there's not a big mess on the way there to kind of clean up. Um, and if there is a mess, you obviously need accessibility to go ahead and clean those things up. So when you're talking about band systems, uh, the band itself is typically going to be um, antimicrobial. It's going to have those factors built into it. It's also going to have um <clears throat> some rigidity or some sorry some texture <laughs> to the outside of the uh, band obviously there's going to be in wet environments um, and we don't want any slippage we want to make sure we have a constant grip on the uh, tray now these these bands will also be um somewhat impervious to liquids and abrasions and certain chemicals some more caustic chemicals can tend to eat at these a little bit but you really shouldn't be using anything super caustic, especially other than really soap and water to kind of clean these up. And as you can see in the top right, where you have, um, let me just, okay. Right up here, you can see that there is an intermediate kind of, there's a, a sink, right? We're gonna have intermediate sinks placed throughout um, this type of system, right? That, that's kind of, the, the benefit of it. If you have a spill, you're able to surface clean it, move it to that drain, and then clean everything out. Um, makes it much easier for accessibility and gives you a good idea of what's happening. As you can see also the return for this conveyor, right? You're always gonna have something that's pulling the item. When we're talking about conveyors, we're always pulling product, okay? We're never pushing it, we're pulling it. So as we're pulling it, the other side of that band has to be, or the, or the conveyor belt, it's got to be going back to the motor, right? So whatever's being pushed out is obviously going to be pulled back. So we're going to have to have a return for the excess of this conveyor belt. The excess for this is going to go down the center of the bed, as you can see in some of these pictures, eliminating the need for a return on the, uh, well, eliminating, eliminating the need for a return underneath. So what that does is it drastically reduces the height of the bed. That really helps because when we reduce the height of the bed, that gives us more room to, to uh, store things like um, dish carts and dish caddies and things like that, uh, dollies, silver soak stations, things like that. It kind of helps them move these items a little bit closer uh, to the bed. Then also for tray makeup, it's huge because now I can bring some of the support equipment closer to the conveyor bed and eliminate the excess stretching and the excess reaching. Okay, so there's definitely some benefits to have to having a band conveyor, but it's you definitely make sure you're using the right application and you always want to make sure it's for trays. Okay, um, because everything is surface mounted, it is the, the cleanest system or the easiest sim system to clean. It's very simple, everything's exposed. The return pulleys are, are surface mounted as well. Um, there's no belt washer because everything is surface mounted, there is no need for a belt washer on these. And I know that because they have some antimicrobial properties into them, um, with the way things are going and a lot of the obviously COVID and 
and when we're talking about um, allergens, as we just went through with Betsy, it'd be a nice feature to add this UV bulb right here, as you can see in the middle. There are very certain manufacturers that offer this, and excuse me, what that does is adds a, a, a ver, um, an extra layer of sanitation because we're now flooding that compartment with UV. Whenever we flood it with UV, we're going to kill the bacteria of anything that may be trying to grow onto that belt. Okay, so it's a um, it's not an expensive option. I would highly recommend it. Um, they do have very good properties and they, we do know what they're used for. Um, so we do have them strategically placed as most people would on their conveyor system. Okay. Um, because it is a light material, we can go on fairly long runs. You know, you're gonna have the ability to create long runs with single motor drives because of the light material of the conveyor belt. So, it, that's one of the things, and the fact that we have a very shallow bed makes it very good and conducive to limited footprint plans, um, locations, right, that you're not able to um, do a bunch of construction with. You may have some um, obstacles in the way. You may have some walls to go through and some radiuses to make. This type of system will make that, we can make longer runs so we can utilize more space um, with a single motor. Okay, so that will um give you some some flexibility it'll give you some benefits of utilizing the system uh where you're limited with your footprint okay um and always like whenever we're doing radiuses and we're doing turns it's always going to be um depending on the uh the size of the item that we're moving so if it's a tray we're going to be limited on on the capacity you know on the uh, size of the radius because of the tray is going to be wide um but if we have smaller products, then we can naturally do uh, smaller uh, radiuses as well. And if you look at the belt, you'll see in the center, there is a, it's a core. Some, some have them spread out, as you can see in the picture. Some have them in one solid core right down the center. Uh, the idea of this is um, typically these, these will be made of Kevlar types of material and it's to prevent stretching and snapping in the field. So we, because they're gonna be used a lot, and obviously we don't we can't have downtime the last thing people want us to be worrying about their belts their belts um, snapping stretching and then we have problems with the operation of the conveyor <laughs> so this is um it was added to the to the band to make sure that that does not happen okay and also when you will be in the field in the event that you maybe have to replace a section or sometimes certain manufacturers when they send these out the bands will not be connected so once you install it and you run the band, it's always a single band. You're going to run it through your pulleys all the way through the motor. And then there's a welding tool. Basically, you put it in a heat box, the two ends, you put them together, you heat them up, and they weld together. And that's how you will um, create that loop, connect the loop on the, uh, on the band system. Okay. So extremely simple system, less moving parts. Um, a lot less preventative maintenance, right? If I don't have the return underneath the conveyor system, which, which we'll go into another in uh, belt setups, and if I don't have um, gear assemblies and sprockets and gear reducers that are creating transitions and moving the belt as opposed to these single uh, pulleys that you see in the motor, motor uh, cavity, you will have to, uh, you don't have to lubricate those points, right? So the preventative maintenance on a uh, band system will be a lot less than some of the other systems that we'll go through um, as we continue to move forward with the different uh, options for your belts. So less preventative maintenance, more room and storage inside the uh, dish room because now that bed is very shallow compared to a slat system or some of our mesh tops. Um, so we're gonna utilize more space. And as I said before with tray makeup, it really gives them the ability um, to get those ancillary support items closer to that bed and it'll be less reaching and less pivoting and turning and things of that nature. So I know we're trying to eliminate um, as, many, as much repetitive bending and turning and twisting and things like that. So a lot of times the conveyors can help with that. Uh, the equipment can help to eliminate some of those things as well. Okay. So, and also too, um, for some of these drop areas, you're gonna see, um, you can you can always do those in different ways as well. We'll get into those a little bit later, um, but those are always areas that you guys are going to have to think of. Okay. 
Sorry, I don't know what happened. Um, then we move into what most people see and what most people envision as conveyor systems are with slat belt conveyors. When we talk about slat belt conveyors, you're gonna have a couple different applications that you can go through. We're either gonna do tray or we're gonna do trayless, okay? And what I mean by tray, I really should kind of specify as larger items versus smaller items. And so anytime you're gonna have a, a, a slat system for trayless, or I mean for trays or larger items, you're gonna get a gap in between those slats, okay? There's gonna be a little bit of gappage um, because they're not worried about things falling through. So the reason that becomes important is when we're taking items from the drop into the dish room, if we have certain radiuses, turns and corners that we have to make it around, those gaps become exaggerated. And once we get exaggerated gaps, that's when items can tend to fall through those gaps and get jammed into the system and just create all kinds of problems, okay? So <clears throat> we definitely wanna make sure that uh, we understand the pieces that the customer are gonna be using and we wanna make sure that, um, that we're gonna account for those from getting from point A to point B, okay? Um, these are great for sorting um, when you have put them in conjunction with the soil dish tables. Um, they're always great for moving products. Um, in the event that you guys decide to move bus tubs or conveyor, I mean, or, or racks, you're gonna double up on your slats. So each slat's gonna give you about 10 and a half inches worth of surface contact. Um, and we know racks are typically 20 by 20. So you're gonna need to double up on your, on your slat belts in order to move that product. Typically, you're not gonna see those on the drop area, which is why on your drop area, you're always gonna have a single belt and then the racks and tubs and things like that will be brought in to the kitchen um, through another access. So depending on where that point is, you can then double up on your slat belts in the dish room to move those over to the sorting area. So you definitely have some options on, on moving products from one spot to another, um, alleviating, alleviating some of that stress and um, some of that weight on the employees. Um, as I mentioned before, when we're talking about um <clears throat> conveyor sizing beds uh, as i mentioned with the uh with the band system this system here does have a return underneath okay and actually let me back up this system rides it's a monorail design which which means basically there's a track that goes down the center of the table that is what the slats will sit in um and that's that's what will will obviously keep it tracked okay the other side of that is there's a return for that conveyor belt. So it's gonna have to come from the top, go underneath and ride along the entire length of the bed. Because we do have a monorail design, because there is a track that goes through the center of that table, it's open and exposed. So as we talked about before with cleanliness and hygiene and making sure we're not making a mess, in the event we do get some spillage or something falls as it's transferring back to the dish room, it's gonna spill through that track. So what we've done and what, what everybody's had to do, obviously when they make their conveyors is run a drip tray that runs the full length of the conveyor. We wanna make sure at any point in, in, during that ride, if it's something falls over and spills, we wanna make sure we're grabbing it in the uh, drip tray and we don't want it to spill on the floor and then create a big mess. So keep in mind that because we have a return and we have a drip tray, the height of that bed is drastically grown to accommodate all the additional, uh, uh, all this stuff, right? Um, and not only that, also keep in mind that the, um, I don't wanna say integrity, but you wanna make sure that the slats themselves are in good working condition. What people forget a lot of times is the bottom feet on that slat is actually what keeps it tracked from one transition to another and also as it's tracking on the bottom, as you can see above the, uh, the drip tray here in the top, you can see that little track. That's what prevents that belt from sagging all the way underneath that conveyor bed. So it's very important to make sure that those slats, that the feet on, on the bottom are, are in good working condition, they're not broken or chipped off. Because if we don't make, if we don't make that transition cleanly, cleanly, because we don't have two feet on each side, we're gonna have problems. Okay. That's just the way those can, that's what, just the way conveyors work. There will be a gap between that bottom track to getting to the top of the bed. 
and the bottom of the slats is what keeps that tracked to those uh, to that track. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so it's always important. Okay, and a lot of times what can happen too is during these, you know, if we get something that falls in between these slats, it creates a jam in the motor, but it will also create <clears throat> broken slats. Okay, so you'll have to replace them. They are fairly simple to snap on and snap off, but you know, that's obviously just cumbersome and just takes too much time. Well, I'm sure we've all been in dish rooms that have broken slats and they just make the most of it. So I really want to make sure that that those are in good working order and that will because that will drastically affect the operation of the conveyor as well. OK, um, that drip tray will be angled and it will be um, it, it, it will angle towards a common drain, just depending on how big the conveyor systems are. We could have intermediate drains um, as well to kind of help with that load. Uh, but these will all have to have access panels and, and access to clean outs and stuff like that. So we always want to make sure that that those are available. Um, and also to realize that in some of the tracking, when we're doing straight shots, um, that will pretty much just typically be the bed and the belt and the chain, okay? And that can tend to beat up the bed a little bit. It also adds a little bit of noise. But as we get closer to the turns and leading into the turns, we will utilize this UHMW material, their guides. They're basically self-lubricating, um, almost plastic kind of guides. So that way, we protect the bed, we protect the chain, because as we make that turn, as soon as we transition in that radius, it's gonna bang into that bed and then it's gonna turn around. So we wanna make sure that we get ahead of that and prevent any kind of pitting or um, degradation of that track uh, because of that belt and because the chain is, is banging into that stainless steel uh, table. So we add this, or there, there will be UHMW guides. And when I say we, I mean people that make conveyors. <laughs> they will um, they will have those in certain areas. Now, if you get to a um, specific type of setup to where you're using a busing conveyor that is set up for dual slats, um, typically they will run those guides the full length of that bed because of all the weight and because of um, it can tend to push down on those uh, the slats and the chain. We want to make sure to protect that bed. So a lot of times what you'll see is that material ran throughout the entire track on uh, busing conveyors and rack conveyors. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you can also, um, a lot of the time, these will always come with belt washers, okay? Belt washers to help obviously keep these clean from all the debris. And when you're sorting and racking, um, things are just going to fly everywhere. So we want to do what we can. Um, you always want to make sure that that does have a belt washer and also you have options with that belt washer. Some of them you can have time wash cycles. Some will have um, recirculating pumps for energy efficiency reasons and some will run when the unit's on and some are independent. So you're going to have some flexibility as far as how you want to set that uh, belt washer up. I would again highly recommend in these times um, and even before I would highly recommend adding a UV light um to that belt washer uh, and the reason we do that is as these items pass through that belt washer they're going to get a lot of coverage on both sides from the manifold but there's still the potential for um some bacteria to, to uh, grab on and start to grow in certain places and what we like to do is add that uv light into that motor housing to ensure that um all the bacteria that's trying to grow has been eliminated and we definitely don't want to pass that back on to the customer or to the employees. Um, so if we can add certain things to make it um, healthier, safer, more, more hygienic, then we're definitely going to do that. And what's nice too is that I'll show a picture in the next slide of exactly where that UV light is in conjunction with the, uh, with the belt washer so everybody get a good idea of what that looks like. Um, <clears throat> But then that's basically the gist of it, adding more um, antibacterial measures, um, safety. That's really the, the key behind that. OK, these ones, um, you know, radiuses, again, are going to be determined um, typically on the items that we're that we're moving. Um, and those are going to dictate kind of how big of a radius we can make or how narrow of a radius we can make. OK, um, you do have a bunch of different ways in order to activate these types of conveyor belts, depending on the application, right? If somebody is over here at the uh, sorting side right here, 
this belt will remain static so people can uh they can sort and rack and stack some of these items and then the person at the end may hit a hip switch or a foot switch um, to activate that conveyor system to get those wares to move forward um this just gives them flexibility obviously to keep up with the um with the uh, amount of wares coming in the volume that's coming in um the pace right they can set their pace with this kind with these kinds of things uh the 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 controllers will have varying speeds i believe anywhere from zero to 40 feet a minute so you are able to kind of adjust um the uh, the speed at which these conveying systems move so that will definitely help to uh, keep up with some of the pace and uh, slow it down if they need to okay um also, these can be as custom as possible. And when we're talking customization, we're talking as we get back towards um, the dish room into the uh, soil dish tables, right? So we're always gonna wanna make sure that, that we can add certain things with that uh, once we get to the sorting area, whether we're adding soak stations or whether or not we're adding wedges and things like that that we'll go into a little bit later. But you do have a lot of flexibility. You always wanna think about storage, rack storage and stuff like that. Um, over shelves, under shelves, there's a lot of different places that you can come up with to store some of these racks um, for when they need them during their peak times instead of having them on dollies just kind of scattered throughout the uh, kitchen. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so remember, when we're doing tray lists, uh, we're doing tray applications or big item applications, you're going to have a, a non overlapping belt. Okay. And as it says, it'll move 20 pounds, 25 pounds per foot. So keeping that in mind when we do racks and tubs besides surface contact in order to move, just to make sure we have enough weight covered, we'll definitely double up on those slats. And when we are doing small wares, like individual forks and spoons and stuff like that, those are the items that we're worried about during those radiuses that when that gap gets exaggerated, those items tend to fall through and create, um, create problems and jams and things like that. So as you can see here, when we're talking about trayless app, when we're talking about trayless, we're also talking about um, overlapping slots. Okay, that is what gives you that coverage for through these radiuses and prevents any gaps from being exposed and getting any wares to fall through. So that's going to be <clears throat> the biggest uh, deciding factor on what type of conveyor belt uh, for slot systems is: are we moving individual small wares or not? And that's going to lead you into exactly what belt you're going to need. Okay. <laughs> also, too, to keep in mind, because we're moving individual wares and not trays and racks, the, the bed tolerance will be much closer to that conveyor uh, belt. So you're not going to have as big of a gap. I'm going to go back one slide. As you can see up here on the right side, you can see that there's some spacing in between on that conveyor bed to the edge of that side splash. When I go to the... Um, trayless system, you can see through the radius here how tight that bed is to that conveyor belt. We don't really need the extra room because we're not having oversized items. Okay. And as you can see here, here's the manifold. You can see you get coverage from top and bottom. But on the picture below it, you can also see exactly where, where to place the UV bulb so it's very effective. Not only are we killing bacteria on the belt as it comes by that UV light, but we're also shining that light into that scrapping area. So by doing that, we're going to kill any bacteria that's starting to grow in that scrapping area. And if we kill that bacteria, we're going to kill the odor. And if we kill the odor, maybe it'll be a little bit more pleasant for people to get in there and actually change those things out. Um, like anything, I'm sure as you guys have, have come across um, in this industry, the easier we make things or the more pleasant we make them, the more likely people will be to do those things. So it's not an expensive option. It does give you a, a great sense of security, um, almost a fail safe. There are contacts switches and things like that. So when people drop down the, um, the panel to get into that scrapping area, we will automatically kill the power to the UV light. So <clears throat> there are certain things that we've obviously taken into consideration um, that we've tried to jump ahead of to prevent any type of harm or injuries to come to somebody getting into uh, uh, this area exposed by UVC. Same type of bulb used in ventilation, okay? The drawback, a lot of times you'll get 
there'll be give and take, right? There's features and benefits. There's pluses and minuses to, to all the belts um, and all applications. The drawback to the overlapping uh, slat system is it'll be a little bit more difficult to clean than the non-overlapping system, which I think we can all understand why. So the belt washer is gonna be key on this type of application as well as a UV light, just to make sure that any of that overlapping area is hit with this UV light and make sure that we're killing any bacteria, okay? <clears throat> so as you can see also in the very top middle where we have the, uh, the silverware items being directed by what we call as a silver sorter or a wedge. And basically what that does is it will guide those small wares down into a cutout in the top of the conveyor bed and it'll drop it into a soak tank um, or silver soaker station, basically a flat sink with um, some uh, soapy water, some chemicals in there to clean these items and typically a rack. So if we can help to alleviate some of the sorting and some of those, um, some of those uh, duties on the employees, then we can increase the efficiency and the throughput uh, in that dish room. So a lot of times when we're doing these things is to help sorting and it's to help keep um, things separated and where they need to be. Uh, for example, we're not gonna get a plate that's gonna go by this silver sorter or this wedge and, and fall down the cutout. And they're not gonna drop down the cutout, um, preventing you know something that we don't want to, to be mixed with our silverware. So there are certain things we can do. Um, just try to keep that in mind. Um, like I said, anytime we can help alleviate some of that, some of those uh, duties from the people in the back, it'll definitely increase the efficiencies of that room. Okay. Um, so as I said too, these are typically for solid applications. You can, and we have in the past, utilize these for offloads from dish machines too. Okay, so it can help to take racks, out of a rack machine and move it down the offload side. So that way we're not backing up the input side. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about that later as well. Okay. Okay, sorry, I'm just, I have a little note in front of me. Okay, <clears throat> now we're getting into a multi, multi-applicational type of belt. Previously, when we're talking about slot belts, right, you're gonna be determining what type of slot belt based on what type of wares we're moving, individual small wares versus larger items. We're talking about band conveyors, you're talking about trays only, right? So those applications are kind of lending themselves to picking the belt for you. In the event that you guys have customers that wanna do racks, tubs, um, they wanna do individual wares as well. And who knows, maybe they want flexibility in the future. Um, maybe they want a more robust system than slats. Maybe they've had some issues with uh, replacing slats in the past. There is a new system, it's a mesh top or a mat top system. And basically what this is, is your all-in-one solution for everything. Individual wares, racks, tubs, and, and you name it, this, this uh, conveyor belt is your top. Why do I say that? It's because we don't have any large gaps in between these linkages. Um, each link will have its own quick release rod. And what that does is it will, um, it will give you the ability and allow you to open up these uh, conveyors, conveyor belts and give you access to the bed. Okay. In the event you have a big spill, somebody knocks over some ranch or I don't know, buttermilk. I don't know what what other kind of ingredients you guys could people could have in there. But if somebody does that, it's going to be a huge mess um, on this belt. Really, any belt. The idea of the quick release is for a couple things, right? Like I said, it gives you quick, gives you good access to that conveyor bed and gives you the ability to clean everything very nicely and easily. But it also gives you the ability to take sections of that belt say three, four foot section and run it through the dish machine so you can help to clean that area a little bit better. So there's kind of a two in one with that. And as you can see on this belt right here, each individual yellow tab is a quick release rod. This one here requires some tools. 
um, basically it just requires a flathead screwdriver to open up the end of that tab and push out that rod. Um, they do have belts now that have uh, the ability to, util to, to do this without tools. So depending on what your preference is for your customer, they may want a toolless application or they may want something with tool. Excuse me. One of the great things, another great thing about this option is the ability to give you bigger width pieces. But as we discussed earlier, when we are talking about moving bus tubs, racks, uh, things of that nature, larger surface area items, right? Instead of doubling up on your slats, as, as we would with that type of system, which means now you have dual gear reducers, you're going to have um, <clears throat> more sprockets, more things to lubricate, more preventive maintenance, it's going to double because now I have two systems working in conjunction with each other to give me a 20 inch surface. This belt right here, I can just give you a, a, a wider piece of conveyor top. So I can give you a six inch piece, a 12 inch, 18, 24, 30 inch widths of this conveyor belt, eliminating the need to now double up and create two uh, parallel systems. So if we can do that, now we've you know, reduced the PM, we've added the ability to move racks, move tubs, um, and it's gonna be, um, it's gonna, it's gonna move more weight as well. So you're not gonna worry about again, having to double these up to get more power, right? This will move about 100 pounds a foot. Very robust, very heavy duty, extremely versatile. What's nice too is that earlier when I was talking about the UHMW material for our slat belts, and typically when we're, we're engaging into a radius or we're leading into a radius, we will apply this material. Excuse me. In this, in, with this conveyor system here, that material runs throughout the entire conveyor bed. So that will drastically reduce the noise and friction um, of that conveyor belt as it's moving and as the power's on. So you're definitely gonna be able to, um, you're gonna be able to hear it, better communication in the dish room, uh, less chances for mistakes and things like that. Um, and it also sits about an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch right in between there above the conveyor bed. So it looks flush. It's not, but it adds a much nicer, cleaner look um, to a conveyor belt if, if there ever was such a thing. So, um, <clears throat> but also because we don't have those exaggerated gaps, we don't have to worry about wares and things getting stuck in between there and causing breakages. So we're definitely going to get a lot more uh, use, I believe, out of each individual link, out of the, this type of uh, setup. But it also gives your customer the flexibility in changing times. If they want to go from reusables to disposables or vice versa, now they don't have to change out their conveyor belt to accommodate maybe a, um, a change in their, um, <clears throat> in their wares, right, or a change in their approach to dining. So these are things that can all be accomplished utilizing one belt. Uh, whether or not it, depending on how big it is. Um, radiuses, again, all going to be determined by the size of the piece we're moving as well as the belt itself. So a six inch belt, I will get a much longer run on a, on a single motor than I would an 18 inch belt. Okay. So, and I can also get tighter radiuses with my six inch belt than I could an 18 inch belt, right? These are all fairly obvious, I would assume. Um, <clears throat> so definitely consider that it will be more expensive these are as i'm showing you these options they tend to get more expensive so uh slat systems will be more expensive than belt than band systems and mesh tops will be more expensive than slat systems but there's always benefits and features to that right if i do bands and i can't use individual wares or bowls or racks or tubs right slats i can do both but i got to make sure i have the right slat system um, and if i want to do conveyors i better double up on that slat and have two systems uh, mesh tops, just give me a wider piece, single motor drive, and then we can continue to build from there. Okay. Um, also, too, you can see that this is a good picture of us putting in conjunction with multiple rollers or rollers, multiple conveyor tops uh, within the same um, within the same table. 
So in the event that they are sorting and then racking and then mo moving those racks, this is a good example of how we can marry those two different applications into one table, okay? <clears throat> now we can get into something a little bit more simpler, something that I'm sure everybody sees in almost every dish room. Um, they're very common. Rollers are, you're going to see those everywhere. You're going to have different types of rollers to your, you know, availability. And most of the time it's going to be based on, um, sorry, it's going to be based on cost and durability. So cost wise and durability wise, stainless steel is always going to be more expensive and more durable. Okay. Plastic is going to be less expensive, less durable, um, but they serve a great purpose and we see them all over the place. You can also get them fixed or you can get them removable, okay? Depending on the size of the conveyor belt or conveyor bed, the distances, how many drains you guys have in there, I would recommend trying to go with removable if possible. It just gives more access to the bed, more access to cleanability, gives them, pulls these things out of the way. And again, the more, the easier we make things to do, the more likely people will be to do them. So we just want to make sure that we're, we're thinking about a lot of these things, um, accessibility, cleanability, when we are um, laying these out. Okay. So as you can see, they come in all different sizes as well, as, as wide as you want. The radiuses can be a little bit different. Spacing can all be different as well. So depending on the items that we're moving, we may want that spacing closer or we may want it further apart. Okay. And the reason, sorry, let me touch on this. The reason that drop-ins or drop-in sections um, rollers are more expensive is because you have to make that frame. Uh, there is no standard, right? We can have different spacing. We can have different radiuses. We can have different widths of these rollers. So the framing is always going to be custom. And that, that could always be, uh, that's always going to add to cost. So just kind of keep that in mind. Anytime I'm changing from a fixed roller to a removable roller, I will add some cost, but I am adding a lot more convenience. Okay. <clears throat> As you can see with some of these, anytime we get into radiuses, if we have a tight radius, we will go ahead and split up these rollers and make them smaller. It's just easier to work with and create radiuses and stuff. Um, so we will tend to do that just depending on whatever it's feeding or whatever that transition is. A lot of times, if we are um, transitioning, say we want to do what's called an up rack system and we're sorting and we're moving racks and we're feeding those over to a certain dish machine, what can happen is as they'll pair powered rollers with non-powered rollers. So when somebody moves the rack up to the top roller section, those powered rollers will move it over to a gravity fed section, as you can see in the center here. And as it hits that gravity fed section, it'll then roll all the way down and feed itself into a dish machine, or at least come to a point to where you have some labor who's going to then put it onto a dish machine. If it's a rack system, you can feed it directly into the rack system. If it's a flight type, you're going to have to have somebody typically um, stand there or put in a mobile bridge that will, you're going to have to move it because there's always going to be a ledge on the front part of that flight type. So you're going to have somebody feeding that into a flight type, or you can have it direct feed into a conveyor system, a conveyor machine. And we can actually, and, and on these conveyor setups, you can have them two separate units, two separate conveyors from the same table feeding two different machines. So you can have a gravity fed system for racks only into a, uh, into a rack type dish machine, or, and you can have the individual wares fed over to a flight type. So just depending on whatever the volume is, the size of the spacing, footprint, um, these types of soil tables can be as complicated as you can think to as simple as you can think as well, okay? And if you look on the lower left, you'll see down here, the exit side of the dish machine, you'll see a roller section, okay? That's to help alleviate that volume from the feed side, right? If I, if I can only have enough space to get a single rack out of my dish machine, then I'm gonna be at the mercy of unloading that rack all the time in order to get more items in, right? If I'm stuck on the output, I can't input. 
So <clears throat> always, always, I would always recommend extending that offload as much as you can. Okay. It'll do a couple things for you as well. Not only will it give you more efficiency and more throughput, because now you're not waiting to, you know, you don't have to unload right away. You may have room for, you know, a few racks. A lot of times too, if you're utilizing high dish, uh, high temp dish machines, those wares will be dry by the time you get a chance to go over and unrack them. So because the, the, the heat from those wares themselves will dry themselves off, it gives them that time as well as gives you more flow. Okay, so always, always think of that as well. More offload if you can is always a good thing. Um, and as I mentioned before, we can do offloads with um, roller sections, as you see down here, and we can do them with slat systems and mesh tops. I mean, is, is again, as complicated as you want to make them, as easy as you want to make it, um, as simple as you want to make it, right? These are all options um, at your guys' disposal. So make sure that you definitely take advantage of that, or at least explore some options as far as, um, you know, what those benefits are, right? For having, say, a slat system versus just a standard roller. So, um, you always have options, right? Um, <clears throat> again, um, this will, because the beds on roller systems are very shallow because we're only accommodating the rollers, um, it will give you more, more uh, room for storage. So as you can see down here in the left, bottom left, you can see all that room between the base of that table and the floor. So that can all be used, um, usable space. So the more usable space we can create in kitchens, the, the better it is obviously for everybody. Okay. Um, also too, in the future, in, in the event that some people wanna change out rollers and maybe they want to go from fixed to removable, that can also be done as well. Okay, they'll make the frame so it sits on that trough, converting that to a lift off style as opposed to a fixed style. So you guys can have some flexibility moving forward too in the future in the event they want to change that out. Okay. Um, I think it's about in on roller. Skate wheels are kind of, you know, you'll see them in dish troughs all the time. You will, you'll constantly see those. Um, Yeah, I can't get rid of that. I don't know why that's there, to be honest with you. If anybody has any, I really don't know where this came from, to be honest with you. I don't know why it's sitting there. Anybody help me get rid of that? Just please move this window away. <laughs> really sorry. I know that's been bugging me because it fades in and out. It fades in and out, so I really can't tell why. It's, I'm really sorry about that, guys. Let me see if I can move something real quick because it keeps telling me to move a certain window. I just went away from the shared application. Okay. Sorry, I know we don't want to take a bunch of this time. Uh, okay, sorry about that. I'll, I'll keep moving forward. I really apologize. Um, <laughs> skate wheels. You're going to have the ability, right, kind of with rollers, you're going to be, you have the ability to choose stainless steel or plastic. And it's going to be for the same reasons, right? Durability and cost. Uh, people don't want to pay for the durability of stainless, so they go with plastic and then they wind up replacing them. And if you have a broken skate wheel, it's a problem. It becomes a big problem. So I'd highly, kind of highly recommend leading with stainless if you have the ability. But you're going to see these in troughs. Um, they're also good and inexpensive way to do tray makeup as well. Same with rollers in the event that somebody doesn't want to spend money for um, motorized items. Um, you can utilize skate wheels and uh, rollers as tray makeup too. So it will also shrink that bed. We don't have a lot of, you know, there's no return. There's no, you know, mechanics or anything like that when you're talking these items. So... Gosh, but you'll always find them in troughs in the soiled area. So don't forget about those. They're always for trays, larger items that you can move across. Uh, sometimes you can do racks and things like that as well. So just know that that's, an, that that's an option, as you can see, past this ridiculous move window thing. You can see the skate wheels will marry up with a band conveyor, okay? And then it'll be fed into a gravity section, which I assume could be leading into a dish room or, you know, leading to... Um, some point of contact for an employee. 
Okay, so just remember that you do have this ability here and um, you have other options. Okay. If we can't go out, we can go up. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, we can go, we can go up. Sorry, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. Um, when we want to go up is when we don't have the footprint to go out. And we don't have the footprint to go out, then um, we definitely want to go up. Okay. Going up does a lot of things. These accumulators help with, uh, with footprint savings. Um, in the event you don't have the room to lay out a conveyor, this also helps with uh, labor savings. Okay. If I have a conveyor system that I constantly need to keep up with, then I need the labor to keep up with that. As opposed to accumulator that will spin around and spin around and will accumulate wares until they are able to offload them, uh, it can definitely drastically help to improve the efficiencies and not have to overstaff a certain area in order just to keep up with the volume. Okay, And the idea here is that when you have different stations, as you see off to the left, or even down below, you can see there's different stations for people. And the idea is that as these wares come by, if the first person can't grab it, the second one can grab it. And if they can't, the third one, and if not, then it goes back out to the, to the front and it circles back around again, collecting more wares. With that said, you will have two eyes, okay? Two electronic eyes, one on the outlet and one on the inlet. And the reason we have it is exactly what I was explaining is in the event somebody does not have the ability to, um, they don't have the ability to grab it and they're gonna let it go, <clears throat> then, um, sorry, I'm trying to get this thing. It's driving me crazy. <laughs> Um, sorry, I could start over. This thing's just really driving me crazy. Gosh. Anyway, sorry guys. This is just not convenient right now. Um, okay, sorry, where was I? Um, <clears throat> so anyway, this will definitely help uh, with labor, right? You can come in, you can have three, four, five tiers. Um, they can be solid tiers and they can be um, individual tiers. Just depends on what they're trying to accomplish. Larger tiers, like full solid uh, carriers, are gonna be more are gonna be heavier to pull off. Individual tiers are gonna be a little easier to pull off, but they could have the ability to get knocked and bumped off track a little bit easier because I don't have the full height carrier hanging on to that collar. So there's definitely some give and takes on that and they're definitely made both ways. So know that you don't have to have this full solid carrier. You can have individual tiers. And I've even had people ask me or give me some suggestions that, um, <clears throat> that if they wanted to remove the, um, the rack, or sorry, they want to remove the bottom tier and put in a rack, that can also help with pre-sorting. Um, and, and take some of that um, burden away from the guys in the back and speed up the efficiencies as well. So you're, you can have some op options here as far as how to set these tiers up and maybe even customize them by adding a rack to the bottom, okay? Um, <clears throat> oh, that's what I was saying. So the electric eyes. So if I don't have the ability to grab everything and it takes a turn back out to the front, <clears throat> sometimes as it makes that transition to the turn, it can be a little rough and items can tend to move. So because we've been so focused on things coming in, we cannot forget about the items going out. So in the event we have a tray that's hanging off on the way out, it'll catch that eye and it'll shut it down, um, eliminating any kind of issues or any kind of uh, uh, breakdowns and uh, lost time. Okay, so always consider that the location that you're gonna wanna put these two eyes, okay? You do have different forms of accumulator styles, right? As it says, some are built to the table and some are not, okay? If you look to the left, this picture over here to the left, this is a completely separate unit with its own leg assembly that is welded and attached to a sorting table, a soil dish table with a conveyor, okay? 
these units down here in the bottom and the bottom right are actually built onto the table. So the table is actually what's holding the accumulator and it has all the legs and everything for the table. Okay, so it's kind of an all in one and this transition is much smoother um, going from the soiled side to the uh, accumulator. So when you're grabbing wares and you're, you're, you're placing things down onto the soiled dish table, this little transition here can be a little bit easier if it's built into the table, okay? So just two different schools of thought. I wanna say most of them now are built into the table, but in the event you do have this type of setup, they are still out there, okay? <laughs> um, the window, basically when they're talking the window length, they're basically, we're talking about the drop window, right? You're gonna want that to be um, the same width as, as the open, you know, as the entrance to the back of that room. So <clears throat> you wanna make sure that you have a good amount of exposure to these carriers and that you have a lot of carriers that are gonna be exposed in that window. So hopefully that makes sense, right? We wanna give as much height and opening to that carrier, but we also wanna give exposure to as many carriers within that window as we can, okay? So always keep that in mind, accessibility, volume, we wanna be able to get there. <clears throat> get to it. I will say um, there's also AC and DC motors, right? I believe the difference is that one is a little bit stronger and one gives you a little bit more range. So it's all, it's a preference as far as what, um, what the manufacturer is trying to accomplish, whether or not they go from DC motors or AC motors, but there is a little bit of benefit to each motor versus the other one. Okay. And again, these can be as custom as possible. We have overhead spray rinses, pre rinses you can undermount them you do you have troughs and silver sorters and all these kinds of things that you can put into this soil dish table um, <clears throat> or the accumulator table to kind of make it an all in one um, type of type of station okay so whether or not it's troughs and expo and uh, disposers or pulpers um, we can marry all these things up to these items as well so don't forget about that and you can always make them as big and, and complex as you need to be. Yeah, I'm really sorry about this. If I can't keep up with it, what happens? This is what happens, okay? I'm gonna get a massive jam and a big backup and it's gonna be, you know, it's not ideal for anybody. And that's definitely not the efficiency and the throughput that anybody's looking for when it comes to a kitchen. Okay, so if we can't staff, we don't have the ability to go out, we definitely wanna go up. Remember, accumulators are great, great options uh, to overcome this type of stuff. Not only can we go out, you know, out with our conveyors, people can go up as well. You have vertical ability. Um, some places have, you know, limited footprints. They may, you know, have a kitchen in the basement. They may want to be serving um, additional floors. Um, I know some places that, you know, high rise buildings may have kitchens on like the 20th floor and serving on the 25th or anyway, any types of uh, vertical accessibility limitations you have, we can help to kind of create that. People can create that with verticals. You have vertical, um, how can I say this? You have vertical shaft type of um, conveyor systems, as you can see here on the right. Uh, this is basically the receiving end. You can see how high the backsplash is to make sure that nothing leans from one side to the other. Uh, but this is a vertical shaft going straight up, straight down. Okay, you can see some of these other landing areas. Uh, but we also have, but there's also spiral verticals, okay? Any belt options you guys are looking for. If we don't have, you know, a shaft to possibly isolate the uh, conveyors in, we can do a spiral. Um, I would always, always utilize fire doors with these because we don't want fires spreading from a kitchen going down that shaft and out the receiving end or vice versa, right? We don't want a fire coming down from where, wherever the final landing spot is and then working its way down the shaft. So always make sure that fire rated doors are included with this kind of stuff. So if something happens, we can shut it off and, and contain that. Um, <clears throat> and as you can say, there, there's typically gonna be cameras. Uh, so you guys can identify jams and, and where these things are taking place. Okay, so it'll just be much easier to work with, much easier to identify things. And as you can see, they're married up with slat systems and rollers and bands and 
also too, there's going to be a couple of schools of thought on how they're going to load these trays into that shaft. Some will have peg systems, vertical pegs lining up with horizontal pegs, and this system kind of works in conjunction like this. Or you have feeder arms that just feed trays and feed items into this shaft. So everybody has their own approach, their own schools of thought on that, their own theories. So I'm thinking that, you know, <clears throat> just basically however they like to approach it. Okay. So just know that there's, that you do have the options with that. Drop off, right? Don't forget about the drop area. There's a lot of different things we can do with the drop area. And even that leak into the back of the dish room, like sight and sound baffles, uh, sight and sound barriers, right? In the event you don't want people looking into the back of that kitchen, you can add false panels and, and things that prevent noise from getting out into the living, into the dining room. And it prevents people from when they drop their trays to look in the back and see, oh, what's going on back there? Um, a lot of times we want to keep that stuff hidden. Um, we can have low profile drops, as you see in the center here. Uh, we can... We can have um, bay doors, roll down doors, pull down doors. There's all kinds of options that you have to also seal that and prevent people from getting back into that kitchen. Okay, so all, all, not only are we thinking about operational times, but we're thinking about non-operational times and how we can prevent people from utilizing these spaces from getting back into the kitchen and causing some havoc. Um, sounds like something I may do back in the day. Also, in the event that you guys were talking about uh, pre-sorting and pre-scrapping and things like that to increase efficiencies in the dish room, at the drop area, if you can see over here, the bottom left, we have cutouts. There's cutouts at the drop area. This will be for um, trash and help to alleviate uh, you know, some of that sorting from the back, increasing, increasing efficiencies in the back of that dish room, okay? So not only can you add scrapping areas here, but you can do recycling as well um, some people will even lay <clears throat> silverware sorters like places they can put their forks knives and spoons i understand that can be somewhat cumbersome to go through in the back and it takes some time so anytime we can alleviate that and help up front <clears throat> you have those options as well one other thing i would highly 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 recommend add more drains at this drop right here add more drains in your conveyor beds okay anytime we get to 10 feet or more add another drain it's so much easier to add a drain during manufacturing than it is to have to deal with pooling problems because they're not utilizing it correctly. I mean, every, you know, when we do these drops right here, a lot of people say, well, these are only for, you know, um, leftover like water or drippings of, of liquid debris. Well, we know people aren't going to pay attention that much. They're just going to come up. Sometimes they're just going to dump everything right there. Not going to pay attention. Um, so some of these food particles can prevent items from draining properly. And it also makes cleaning it at the end of the day more difficult because I got to reach out to all these corners and bring it over to a single common drain. So if I spread drains out, it makes it easier to clean too at the end of the day. So just some things to think about um, when you're laying out the drop side as well, okay? And, and remember, we're gonna have that, you're gonna need access to the motors within that conveyor that's at the drop. So whether or not you dress it up in, in the front. Hey. <laughs> Sorry about that. My dog's getting a little tired of hearing me talk. Um, <clears throat> so, um, sorry, totally. Left. Oh, you didn't need access, right? You're going to need access to these motor housings in the front. And if you don't want to do it in the front, see, we have this nice facade here. Do it in the back, right? You're going to have to have access to these motor housings. You're going to need to, you know, grease up the uh, sprockets and the gear reducers. So you're going to need access to these things regardless so just make sure you have access either on the front side of that drop or the back side of that drop okay um i think i've got everything here here's some of the other options and accessories I'm kind of go through this a little bit quickly i know i'm probably running out of time here um but uh you you have the ability here to add as i was saying as we were saying right overhead um reels or, I mean, undermounted reels, overhead pre-rinses, undermounted pre-rinses, right? All about flow and moving and getting things from one point to another point. So always make sure that those spaces are open as much as possible. And you also have magnets for um, silverware and stuff like that and tray stackers. And so you have a lot of different things to come together 
um, to create your dish room and to create your uh, soil dish table. Okay, as, as complicated, as simple as you need it. And last thing, when we're going through design, right? What are we looking for to make sure we have all our bases covered, right? What do we need to know? Okay, we wanna know overall room dimensions, obstacles, drop off windows, access, right? A lot of those things we we're just talking about. You wanna know what type of service, right? Tray or tray list, uh, room, room service, patient, banqueting, right? What, what is the overall operation of this facility? All right, how many people at peak times, right? We're not worried about all the other times. We need to know that at our very most peak critical time, can we handle the throughput and volume that we have? That will set us up for success for any other time throughout the day. Okay. How many employees, right? This goes back to um, labor. Do we want to go up versus out, accumulators versus conveyors and all that stuff, right? This will kind of lead you into that. Is there a pole port disposal, right? What are the things that I'm marrying up to this uh, system? Um, you know, pre-rinse, all the things that we just kind of talked about, other accessories to, to include for washing and sorting and all that stuff. Storage needs, right? Overhead shelves, under shelves. You know, we're going to need to store racks, dirty racks, clean racks. We're going to need to store them when we're, we're in use. So these are all things to make sure that we are uh, taking into consideration when we're looking at a dish room, right? It's types of dish machine. What are we feeding? Flight type, rack type. Um, you know, what's the operation going to be? Type of controls, right? Foot switch, hip switch. Do we want standard controls that just have a dial and we turn it on and it goes? You have options when it comes to um, controls with these and, and engaging power. Drain locations, just like I talked about. Anytime you go be beyond eight, 10 feet, add more drains, add more drains. Okay, this may change. I think when I was talking with Janelle, she brought up a good point. It says each person needs two and a half feet of working space. That could be more considering all the COVID things, right? Who knows what those are gonna look like uh, in the future. So there are all the things we need. And that's it. I'm done boring you guys with conveyor stuff. So hopefully there was enough information in there um, to kind of give you a good start. Um, obviously any questions I would, you know, love to try to answer them. Yeah, Tom, thanks so much for that. You know, let's do a quick poll. We have one poll to run and then we're gonna, um, there's a couple of questions, okay? Mm -hmm. So you should be able to see this poll on your screen right now. Yes. Would design assist with a dish room from the manufacturer be an asset you would take advantage of? great. <clears throat> it's great news. And I'm going to jump in here and beat you up just a little bit, Tom, sure. based on that poll result right there. Um, so this is something that that in-house here at Clevenger, we struggle with a little bit. So I want to hear your comments about this, but I, I've been involved in a couple um, conveyor accumulator setups and, you know, we do all of our work in Revit. So okay. it's all 3D stuff, you know, the old AutoCAD drawing just doesn't help us that much. Um, is Caddy in a position where if we gave them a floor plan, you guys could provide us a Revit model of that accumulator slash conveyor setup? Is that something you guys can, uh, can provide? Yes, sir. That's what we wanna hear. <clears throat> yeah, we also have, you know, when I say design assist too, we, we have some people in our back pockets that were operators <clears throat> for a long time and can take a look at certain situations because they've been through them and kind of say, hey, you know, what about this idea or what about a pre-scrap here and a load here? You know, so there's certain things that they can help with uh, efficiencies and flow that we tend to lean on them for. Excellent. Thanks. Janelle, go ahead with the Q&A. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, we have a couple of questions for you, Tom. Yeah. We like your conveyors and accumulators, but do, but do not see many using the vertical conveyors. How often do you see operators using the vertical conveyor approach? Not very often, I'll be honest. We don't see it very often. <clears throat> we are in the process, though, of replacing a massive one for a university. Um, we have been approached recently by a lot of the B&I type of companies 
who are looking at things like this as they, you know, take on new locations and, and may have uh, limited footprint restrictions as well as employee restrictions. Uh, these vertical conveyors, are, they're actually starting to kind of uh, gain a little bit more traction, but honestly, there are very few and far between. And I'm going to jump in there for a second too, Tom, if you don't mind. From a design standpoint, James, um, just something to think about there. So I've, like I said, I've only been involved in a couple um, conveyor accumulator setups, but they were all hotel applications. And what we actually used them for was a scenario where the employee dining room was on a different floor than where the wear washing was taking place. And it was easier to set up an accumulator in the employee dining room and run a conveyor um, downstairs to the wear washing room than have a separate wear washing room at the employee dining. Right. And that could also be utility restrictions. Uh, there could be a lot of restrictions within those areas that may not allow you to get everything you want in there, which leads you to try to come up with alternatives. Yeah. So sometimes you just have to think about your scenario and the use and, and that's where we, we leaned real heavily on the um, conveyor manufacturer for design assistance there. I don't remember if it was caddy or not, but it could have been. So, <laughs> but yeah, just lean on your, your uh, manufacturer and, and they'll help you out with that stuff. But sometimes you just got to think out of the box. Exactly. And sometimes it may take somebody who's been through that scenario outside of the box to kind of push us back to that, you know, that idea. Okay, a couple more questions for you, Tom. Um, are, you, are you still providing refurbishing or is Caddy still re re providing refurbishing? Yes, absolutely, thank you. They, um, <clears throat> we, we, do, we are listed to refurbish any existing conveyor. It doesn't have to be Caddy's, it can be anybody. And there's a lot of benefits to refurbishing conveyors, right? I don't have to tear out the entire system. It's gonna take less time. And a lot of times these are going to be in older types of buildings when you're doing refurbishments. So if I was to tear out an entire conveyor system, I may risk exposing or opening up a wall or exposing lead or something, asbestos, and then we really have a big problem. So if we can keep a lot of these things in place and basically replace the conveyor bed, rebuild the motor housing, all new sprockets and pulleys, um, they give it a two year warranty, which is typically longer than a brand new one, which would be one year parts and labor. <clears throat> um, and it's just a much quicker, better process. So it's also something for designers to keep in their back pocket in the event you guys have a location that has an existing conveyor and they may be looking to save some money. Um, it'll be about half the cost usually. Um, so it's a nice alternative to, oh, let's rip it all out and bring a brand new one in. So yes, absolutely. And accumulators as well. One last question, and uh, we'll probably have to do like a quick answer to get it in, but how do you feel about rotary accumulation tables between accumulators and flight type machines? <clears throat> rotary accumulation tables? I'm not sure if I've ever ran into one of those. I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure if I've seen that. Typically, um, hmm. Typically, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I apologize. I have not seen a rotary accumulator table. I'm just used to accumulators being paired up with solid dish tables or, or a conveyor system that as they're sorting and separating that they will determine what items go on which conveyor belt to feed which dish machine. Uh, but I am not, I apologize. I'm not familiar with accumulating, accumulation tables. So no, it's me. I, I would suggest that, uh, go ahead and shoot Tom an email and maybe follow up with that conversation uh, afterwards. Yeah, thanks again, Tom. We appreciate your presentation. And we're going to go ahead and I'm going to hand it over to Tim McDougald right now. So okay. thank you. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate your time again. All right. Thanks, Tom, for that presentation. And thanks again to Betsy for hers as well. So that brings session two to a close. I would like to invite all of you to join us for the final session of this two-day event. This session will start at 1245 p.m. as Kevin Couchman will kick off the session discussing trends in equipment followed by a demonstration on cooking with combis and an awesome end of the event with Rich Malachy talking digital footprint. We'll see you guys at session three. Thanks.